<clears throat> Good evening. On behalf of the Plymouth Canton Schools, the Student Family Engagement Department, we would like to welcome you tonight to the, our presentation, How to Speak So Kids Will Listen, and How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. I would like to take this time to thank the School Violence Prevention Coalition for collaborating with us on these presentations, as well as the Penn Theater, Ellen Elliott, for hosting our events. I now would like to introduce Dr. Hasti Rabu. She is the owner and a clinical director of Mala Child and Family Institute. They have partnered with the Plymouth Canton Schools in supporting our students, our families, and our staff. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. So when I was thinking about the idea of how to listen so our kids will talk and talk so our kids will listen, I started actually wondering, when do we lose the art of connection? Like, what happened where you needed to come to a theater and have someone like me in a suit talk about how to connect human to human, soul to soul. Because that's what really we're talking about here, right? Connection. Not the talking. Question. Yes. What if we never had the connection in the first place? Thank you for saying that. Okay. Thank you for saying that. That's where I was going. What happened? So that's actually what I want to start with. Right? Why do we need to know how to connect? Since human nature, when it comes to safety, it is dependent on our need to form connections. Where did we go wrong? I was reflecting on that, and I think that is a good place to start this talk tonight. Because I don't want to just be here giving you tips, parenting tips. God knows that you can go on Instagram for that. So what happened? You know, in the 30s, actually the feedback a lot of psychologists were giving to parents was that if you want to raise a child with good character, you ignore them when they're having a hard time. That's how you build character, toughening kids up. So that's how our grandparents were raised. And that's how our parents were raised. And that's how we were raised. And it fits really well in this culture of capitalism which is all about doing, achieving, working, making money, getting degrees, spending money, right? Being exhausted, doing it all over again. It was necessary. All the parenting tips that were given from the 30s to the 90s was necessary for what was happening at the time in the country, which was that things were being revolutionized, technology is booming, just a lot happening. And they needed people to do, to perform, which requires disconnecting from the self. Right? Even techniques like letting a child or a baby cry to sleep because they needed mothers to go back to work. Because the more people work, the more people pay taxes. So how do we get back to our core? I want you to really think about that all the things in the books, all the things on Instagram and Facebook, it's within you your ability to attune into another being, feel what they're feeling, see them for who, you, who they are, accept them for who they are, 
that's within you already. The question isn't how do you learn to listen. The question is how do you remove all the barriers in the way, which is through our domestication. How do we untrain ourselves to become attuned again? Which goes back to what was it like when you were growing up? Who was attuned to us? Who saw us for who we were? Accepted us exactly how we were and where we felt really safe with them. I want you to think about that right now. In my practice, most parents that come to see me and talk to me, they were part of a generation where that was not a thing. Their parents were in too much of a survival mode. They didn't have that luxury. To make their family safe, they needed their kids to perform, to behave a certain way, to people please, to excel. That is how they brought safety for their family. It can be really easy to feel angry at our parents. I've tried that. It feels good. Eventually, it doesn't work anymore. You have to make sense. You have to form meaning. And you want to look at everything through the lens of safety. How did that behavior make the family, make the child, make the parents more safe? I was raised in Iran. I immigrated to America when I was 13. At that time, in my country, girls who don't ask a lot of questions, who are complicit, are safer. Things clearly, if somebody watches the news, can see that women are trying to not live that way anymore in my country. But for a really, really long time, if you raised your daughter to be that way, they would be safer in their homes, with their husbands, in their communities. In many cultures where there's poverty, education is the only way to safety. So looking at it through that lens, the lens of trauma, that our parents did what they had to do to keep us safe. And at that time, maybe that was necessary. And is it necessary anymore? No. Not if you're sitting here. Not if you live in Plymouth, Michigan. Right? Because you have financial safety, you're resourced, your child goes, through, goes to a wonderful school with wonderful education, you have job stability. In regards to just society accepting people's differences, things have really changed. So it's time that we get back to our core. Anyone here heard of the author Dan Siegel? Good. I'm a big fan of him. Read his book if you can. He talks about something called the four S's. And he says that it's crucial when it comes to the relationship you have with your child. Anybody heard of the four S's and knows what the four S's are? Or want to just take a guess at some of the S's? Yes. Safety. Seen. No, but good. The child must feel seen. Secure. 
Secure. Secure. Soothe. So, here's the way we want to think about it. In order for me to let you soothe me, I need to feel safe with you. In order for me to let you support me on an emotional level, soul level, I need to feel safe with you. In order to feel safe with you, I have to feel seen by you for who I am. Not who you want me to be. Not what the society wants me to be. For who I am in my core. How do we make children feel that way? By the time a lot of parents get to me, there's a lot of damage done in their foundation with their child. And they come to work with me because they can't get their kid to do homework or the chores. And they're like, can you just get her to put the freaking laundry in the basket? That's all I want. I will pay you a million dollars. And they forget that the, the foundation of the house is really, really shaky. And I'm asking them to go back to step one, which is get to know your kid. Experience joy with your kid. Be with them. Connect with them. Let go of the agendas. Change the dance that you have between each other so that when they are with you, you are the lily pad. See, there's a lot of scary things out in the world. On social media, being a teenager nowadays is not easy. Being a middle schooler nowadays is not easy. We want to be the lily pad so that our children can come like a little frog, hop on, rest, and then go off. Hop back on, rest, go off. But most often in our today's society, Kids can't do that with us because we cannot rest. We are too busy doing. We're too anxious. If they are here and we wanted to come down here, we have to be down here emotionally, nervous system wise. We now know that in human-human interaction, your brain picks up on my nonverbal cues much faster than my verbal cues. And the way I look at you and my tone of voice and my body language is doing two things. It's either sending you signals of safety or it's sending you signals of threat. And it's adaptive. Back in the day, where there was, we lived in the cave or the jungle, and we needed humans to be that attuned with each other, right? So that if your little babies saw danger in your eyes, they knew in man there was a tiger coming, and they would be running with you. There's no tiger anymore. And parents are really stressed out. Their nervous systems are very dysregulated chronically. So when their kid comes home to rest in them, in their soul, they can't. And it causes a rupture in their dance.
And that's hard because there's a lot that needs to be done. We gotta pay bills. We might have our own parents that need support. We might have a stressful job. We might have our own mental health challenges. But at the end of the day, your kids, in order to feel safe enough talking with you, they need to feel like you are a calm person. You don't have to be calm all the time. But can they rest in your energy? Can they reset in your energy? Raise your hand if that feels kind of hard as a parent for you. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I grew up with a mother who couldn't sit still. She was a perfectionist. Her house was always spotless. There was always fresh food that she was making from scratch. The house was ready for guests at any minute. To be fair to her, we live in a culture that people didn't call, they would just knock on your door. Thank God that's not the case anymore. But I don't have memories where she was just sitting next to me, being with me, showing curiosity. That's why kids like to come and see a therapist. A good one is just really being with them. There's no agenda they're pushing on them. With their nonverbal cues, with their voice, with their body, with their eyes, everything is saying, you are safe, I'm here. It's an art. I do have a therapist voice that I have had to work on. It's not my voice at home. But I've had to train myself to be that way with my own kids. People work with me and they assume I'm like super mom. You, you know, leave me to my own devices. I would be pretty dysregulated all the time. It's just not how I'm wired, but I have to work at it. It's effort. Most people think about mental wellness of their family and their children like picking out wallpaper. Once it's chipping, they pay attention. That's called the wallpaper guy. But mental wellness for your family should be the foundation. Everything else should be built around it. How many people you know who live that way? Even though we know that it's the number one predictor for literally everything, especially women. Do you guys know what is the number one woman killer in this country? Aside from marriage? <laughs> Just kidding. Suppressing anger. Women who suppress anger have three times a higher chance of getting cancer, dying early, all the things. Having an autoimmune disease, all the things. So, I want you to take a minute right now and think about in your life since you were born With who in your life did you feel like your soul could rest? Who was your lily pad?
For some people, it might have been an artist and they listen to their music. When they listen to that music of that artist, in that they could rest. For some, it's God. When they were talking to God, they felt like they could rest. For others, might be a grandparent, a mother, a father, an older brother. Now I want you to think, visualize them in your head. Hold that in your head. Hold that moment. What was it about them? What was about that dance? What was about that interaction that felt so nourishing? Most of you would say, they just wanted to be with me. They didn't have an agenda. They didn't want to control me. They could have humor with me. They could have fun together. That's what kids need. At the end of the day, that's what they need. They need to know that no matter what's happening in the world, that if they come to us, we can do that. We will put everything else to the side and we can do that. Raise your hand if you have someone like that in your life right now. Some people, yes. Good. Some people, no. Brene Brown once said that it's really hard to give our kids something we haven't figured out how to give ourselves. I'll tell you a story. My son Levi has autism. This year he started kindergarten. So first day of school, I drop him off, I'm driving home, I'm crying, and I just go into prayer mode. I'm like, please God. Please make sure that he can communicate his needs to people and that people will show up and meet his needs and support him. And then I paused and I had this moment that like I don't really know how to do that myself. Very, very hard for me. Very, very hard for me to identify what I need, communicate what I need, chronically feel unworthy of getting support, chronically feeling like a burden, right? If I want to be my kid's teacher, it starts with learning the lesson myself. Anyone here went to college and you had to take courses, and they were taught by grad students who didn't know what they were doing. I was the grad student. I taught those courses. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? You kind of like, are there children in this, in this, can I swear there's children here? That doesn't, okay. You're half doing it, right? You kind of like, you know, and they know, the, kid, the students know, but they're hoping you give us an extra credit, whatever, you know? Our kids can tell. They can tell when we don't have our stuff together with our feelings. They can tell. They're more attuned into what's happening in their environment than even we are. And they are constantly telling us with their behavior, slow down. Notice what's going on in our home, between us, each other, 
slow down, attune, attune, attune. They're constantly doing it with their behavior. Do you know how it feels on the inside for parents when kids are doing that? How does that make adults feel? Mm-hmm. Uncomfortable. Mm. Annoyed, thank you. You feel annoyed. Oh, yes, it's so annoying. It's really annoying, right? Because we are, as adults in our society, used to staying in the top energy. We're doing thinking. All we're doing all day is busy, worrying, thinking, thinking. We're in the head energy. We're not in the soul energy. We're not feeling, we're doing, we're thinking. We're thinking about the worst case scenarios, worrying about the what ifs, not tolerating uncertainty, wanting to control, get ahead of things, smooth things out so nothing bad ever happens, adding suffering into our own lives. Our kids are not like that. Our kids are in their bodies and they feel everything and they need us to drop down into our own bodies so that we can connect with them. But it's a lost art in our society. I have a much, much easier time doing this work with kids and teens than adults. Asking an adult to literally drop in and feel their emotions, some adults in my office dissociate. That's how hard it is for them. So, let's say you are with your kid and you want to talk about something hard. Is that why you guys are here today? How did we talk to kids about the hard things? I would say the number one parenting mistake parents make is that they pick the worst times. They pick the time that the kid is having a hard time. That is never a teaching moment. You have been given a gift to be this soul's teacher, the biggest teacher they'll ever have because they are addicted to your love. They will forever be addicted to your love. So you have to ask yourself, when is a teaching moment for this child? Or when are they in their zone of learning? It is never when they're having a hard time. Because when they're having a hard time, they are working from the back of their brain. We call it the reptilian brain. When you are in your reptilian brain, you are in fight or flight or freeze. What you want to do is seek some kind of pleasure or escape some kind of danger or just engage in something really familiar. When we are in our zone of learning, we are in the top of the brain. There's enough blood flowing to the front. So, that means getting to know your child, thinking when are they in a good place to talk. Sometimes it can be the driving time. Sometimes it can be Saturday morning. Sometimes it might be while you're building or doing something with them. And that is when you have some of these conversations. Not with the intention to control and criticize but to understand and show true curiosity, which is so hard for parents to do because they're so anxious. They're anxious about their children's lives going south. They're anxious about their kid not making it in life, something bad happening to them because they don't learn their lessons before they leave the nest. You know what I tell parents? 
Get out of the way. Let life happen. That's how character is built. But stay close enough so they never feel lonely when they're struggling. What predicts outcomes in kids is not hardship, it's loneliness. It's okay for your kids to struggle and go through hard things, as long as they don't feel alone. And they won't feel alone if they don't feel like you're so anxious about controlling their lives. There's a really good book called The Prophet, and there is a poem in there talking about that our children are not really our children. They come through us, but they're not ours to own. They're not an accessory like a purse. And we have this gift on this journey of life to walk aside them for a certain amount of time in this really intimate way. But it's really their own lives and you don't know how their lives are supposed to work out. You are not going to be able to teach every lesson to them before they leave. Somebody else, like a really mean girlfriend in, her, in college, they're going to be teaching them all kinds of lessons. Or a mean boss, or a wonderful boss, or a roommate. There are teachers everywhere. You are not carrying this burden on your own. Enjoy the journey with the soul next to you. That's why kids don't talk to their parents. Because the parents are so anxious about something bad happening to the child. And they will literally say it like, I don't know how I could handle if anything bad ever happened to you. You know? Hey, I'm a parent. I get it. I have lots of intrusive thoughts about bad things happening to my kids. That's why I'm in therapy. Get a therapist. It's wonderful. If you have anxiety as a parent, good. That means you're human. Yeah. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. You worry about their future, you have intrusive thoughts that their heart's gonna get broken, that they're gonna struggle with depression and anxiety. Good, that means they're important. It's what you do with the anxiety that you have, it's how you cope with it. And you don't cope with it through controlling them. I once said to a, a dear friend, I don't know if I want to put Levi in this therapy. Like, I don't want him to grow up and have anxiety. And she goes, honey, he's going to have anxiety. Have you met his parents? I'm like, oh, okay. Right? What are you guys hearing me say tonight? Can someone tell me what you're hearing me say? Relax. Do less. Do less. Be present. Be present. Take, a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Play more. Play more. Who finds it hard to experience joy with their kid? Joy is really the number one medicine for everything. Ask yourself if you laugh with your kid. Like, do you true? Can you literally do the belly laugh with them? These are the foundational things needed so that when you go to do the talking, they actually want to listen to you. Mm hmm. Do you have fun with them? Like, do, I, do, do I want to talk to someone who I don't, I don't have fun with? No. Do they accept me for who I am? 
Can we just be together? All of those things. When you go to have the hard conversations, start the conversation with curiosity. Here is how that's going to look like. But you can't go home and use it if you don't need all the other things I'm teaching you, okay? All right? There's no shortcut. Okay? I will find you. I promise. I'm watching all of you. All right? Okay. I'm noticing that he's been having a really hard time taking showers recently. It's been really hard for you to get in the shower. It's been hard. Talk to me. I'm not mad at you, honey. I'm not mad at you. What's going on? Why has that been hard for you? And you just listen. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what the kid might say. I don't know. Because they're worried you're going to criticize them, right? You're going to give them lots of solutions. You're going to problem solve for them. You're going to jump down their throat. I'm not mad at you. I want to know what's going on. It's just like, like, I just want to keep playing my video games, you know, I don't know what, what is something, you know. It's so cold when I get, I legit, I worked with the kid and they were like, it's just so cold when I get out of the shower. Like, I hate that, that's all I can think about, how it's going to be so cold. Yes. There's a solution. Yes! But you don't tell them the solution. You say, that makes sense. You love playing your video games. Video games, your video games are so fun. You don't want to stop. You wish you could do it all day. Yes, oh my bad, you know? I love, I love, yeah, ice cream. You know what? The new season of Crown is out. Mm, it's good. I love watching the Crown, the show of the Crown all day. I could do it all day. Like, yeah, you're right. It can be so hard to turn it off. I get it. That sounds really hard. To stop doing something fun, to go do something so boring. What do you think you need to make this easier? How can I be there for you? What would be a good solution? And then you shut your mouth and you let them come up with some solutions. And that's called the collaborative problem solving approach. That's how you raise an adult. When you don't do that, here's who you raise. That guy who gets really defensive every time his wife brings something up, that's who you raise. Or the guy who just is constantly criticizing his family, that's who you raise. You don't want to do that. Right? Nobody wants to do that. So it requires you to slow down and let go of your agenda and see life skills building as a process for every child, and making it a conversation during which they feel safe. No different than teaching them math. Life skills are no different. It's about the life skill you want them to have. So what would be the life skill in that situation? Can someone tell me? With a name. That's the one teamwork. But regarding like stopping video games and getting in the shower, what is that? It has it's two words. Self motivation is good. Yeah, 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 I like that one. Someone said something else. Self control. Self control is another one. Yeah, yeah. One more. So it's with the word letter D, and the second one's a G. Two words. D and then G. Delayed. 
gratification. Yes, that one. Yes, 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 right? It's a really important life skill, delayed gratification. It falls in the category of self-control, impulse control, all of those things, yeah. Basically the same thing. <clears throat> but it happens when you get them to slow down and think from a place where they're not feeling criticized or shamed. When somebody feels shamed, they have no access to their frontal lobe. When someone's feeling criticized, they have no access to their frontal lobe. So they're not really doing that proper learning. They might change their behavior, but it's all fear-based. It's called like people-pleasing, you know, like how we were raised. We don't want that for our kids. We want that child to grow up and notice himself maybe doing it with something else and having a different conversation with himself. Like, I care about myself. I want to take care of my responsibilities. I want to have balance. Versus that internal voice we all have. It's like, oh, you're so lazy. I got another episode. Oh, no wonder, like, everyone hates you. Like, most people, that's the kind of voice they got. Or they're so busy trying to make no mistake so that they never have those voices. They're so busy doing everything perfectly so they can avoid those voices, right? They don't give themselves even a little bit of room to make a mistake. We've lost the art of listening. So, how do you practice that? When you're sitting with somebody, just work on asking yourself, is my tone of voice, is my body language, and is the way my eyes are looking at them, letting them know that I am safe, am I sending them signals of safety? So am I turning towards them, looking at them, my shoulders are a bit down, my throat is soft. That's the first one. Nonverbal is number one. Number two is called labeling and validating. So um, they say to you, I don't know. What, 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 tell me someone. Tell me something. Their kids. Their kid really, really, really wants, and they're driving you crazy about this thing. Someone tell me something. Concert tickets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really think Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I really want to go to three different ones. Right. And you, you say, yeah, you really want to go. You really want to go. If that, that would be so fun. I'm hearing you say that you really want to go and see Taylor Swift at three different concerts. Man, that would be, that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You just, la you just label, you validate, that's it. You are the captain of the ship. As a parent, you don't want to be a dictator and you don't want to be a lawyer. You want to be the captain of the ship. The dictator says, don't even ask me why. Of all the things I do for you, you want to question why I'm telling you no? Go to your room. That's a dictator. The lawyer keeps explaining the reason why you said no. Keeps explaining, keeps explaining. They let their child put them on in the courtroom. And you keep negotiating. And you let it go back and forth and the back and forth and the back and forth. 
You played a tug of war with your kid. You want to be the captain of the ship. The captain of the ship is very grounded in their reasoning. And their reasoning is based on their family values. So, in our family, we value health. Let's just say. You cannot go to three movies this week that are all late because you're not going to get good sleep. And in our family, we really value health. And sleep is a big part of that. But I really, really want to go. I know, it makes sense you want to go. Yeah. You want to go be with your friends, that makes sense. I don't, I'm going to be left out. Yeah. That sounds really hard. It's hard when all, they're all going. Oh, it's hard. Yeah, but there everyone's going and you're not. I'm sorry, honey. That sounds hard. And you need to really mean it. Kids can tell when you're validating to shut them up or if you're validating because it's a human right to feel validated. So you work on connecting with how they're feeling in that moment and you just sit with that hardness. When you say yes to children, when you're met, supposed to say no, you're teaching them how to manipulate others to get what they want. So it's okay to say no. Explain your reasoning one time, and then just shift to having empathy for why they're struggling accepting that no. And if they're being like really annoying after some point, just be like, okay, like I need some space. If you catch it in yourself where you, you, you're maxing your capacity, just say, you know, we need to take a break from this conversation. It's okay if you do that. You're not failing as a parent. Ask yourself if they were in a romantic relationship down the line, and if their partner said no to them, what would you want them to be able to do? You would want them to be able to tolerate their partner's boundaries. If their partner got up and said, you know, I'm kind of done with this conversation. I said no to buying the jacuzzi. And like, you know, we can talk about it another time, right? You don't want to like follow them around room to room, throwing a temper tantrum. So it's also okay for you to say, we're done with this conversation. Everything has its limit. When they come to you complaining about what the kid did on the bus or what the teacher said, don't jump to, well, what did you do? Now, we do that from a good place in our hearts because we want to make sure they have the skill of taking perspective, right? It makes sense why we do that as parents. But it's not what our kids did in that moment. In every moment when you're having a dance with your kid, they're asking you three questions. Does anybody know what those three questions are? Close. Do you hear me? Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do I matter? And I would make the argument that in any kind of intimate interaction with anyone in your life, that those are the three questions every human is asking. We're asking those three questions with our significant others, with our co-workers, when we pray with our God, with our higher power, with our children. Those are the three questions we are asking. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do I matter? Right? And some kids just, it's, it's, we, it's what we should show is that it's their perception. So I, have, I work with a lot of kids where they'll feel like they are not important. And the parents say, I, 
How? I would die for you. And what research unfortunately shows is their child's perception. If the child feels like, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do I matter? Not the parent says. So you can go home and ask. Most importantly, ask yourself if with your own parents you felt that way. And if no, you got some work to do. We call that healing in therapy. And it's priceless and it's lifelong. There's no expiration date on it. And the more we learn how to give ourselves that, make ourselves feel heard and seen, validate our own feelings, I'm noticing myself feel really anxious right now. It makes sense that I'm feeling anxious. This presentation is really, really important. And I know I'm safe. And I don't have to do it perfectly. And I, it's okay if I mess up. And my worth is not attached to this. This is for the community. And what an honor and what a privilege to be here. <sighs> right? When I can do that for myself, I can parent myself. Because that's not what the parenting I got. Then I can show up easier for my child. Versus, oh, like, that was not a cool thing I said. I sounded stupid. Blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Is what I'm saying tonight resonating with you guys? Yes. Those are those are some super painful questions. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that it feels painful. feeling the pain. That means you're really brave. If you tend to cope with your feelings and pain in life by detaching and suppressing and avoiding, looking at all the guys here right now, just kidding, not. Your life equals suffering. It's actually a real formula. I didn't come up with it, but it says, life equals pain. Pain is part of life. Pain is part of life. It means you're alive. You feel pain, good. You're living. Pain times resistance to the pain equals suffering. Now, suffering is optional. So the pain is the fire. You want to walk through the fire. You don't want anyone to walk through it for you. You want to do it yourself. Your biggest lessons are in the fire. You just need a witness. You need someone close enough right there that says, I'm right here and I see you doing it. We just need a witness. We don't need anybody to do the hard work for us. And that's where the lessons are. If anyone here feels like they need more resources, more support, I would say my biggest go-to's, aside from Dan Siegel, I wish he was my father, would be Dr. Shafali, I wish she was my mother, I would say Shafali, Dan Siegel, Gabor Mate. Those would be the folks you want to marinate your mind in every day because we've been domesticated 
So we need to undo it and it just takes a lot of work, right? Commitment. And a really good therapist is also really, really helpful. Very few people can do this work alone. I can't. And all my friends are therapists. And I still have a therapist. Dan Siegel, Shafali, S-H-E-F-A-L-I, Gabor Mate, G-A-B-O-R-M-A-T-E. He just came out with a new book called The Myth of Normal. Oh, rock your pants. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he's my grandpa. That's my happy place. Okay, my organization's name is Mala Child and Family Institute. We pick the name Mala. It's like the rosary because our core is about connection. Relationships make or break us. We are told that we're supposed to function independently and be super independent. It's just not the truth. It's a lie. We thrive in relationships. We're supposed to be interdependent. We're supposed to have people to rely on. And we are a mental health organization in Old Village and in Ann Arbor. And we provide mental health services to kids as young as two, and parents, and families, and couples. And our work is neurodiversity affirming, meaning we really know how to work with neurodivergent kids who have ADHD or autism or learning disability. We're culturally sensitive. We have providers that speak different languages, different faiths, and we are all trauma-informed. Trauma is my love affair. It's what I went to grad school for. I look at everything through the lens of trauma. It's just the way I digest information. And if you guys need resources, reach out to us, ask us questions. We are a resource for the community. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I appreciate you. We need to hear that. So um, my name is Kathy Grotis. I'm a psychologist and the mental health manager for the Plymouth Camp Schools. So we thank you for coming tonight. We have a session again in January. So you're all welcome back. We do want to do the raffle. Did everybody get a ticket? Okay. Let me, I'm going to ask if you would pull it for me. Hold on, hold on. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right. Everybody get a ticket?